the recording because if I don't do that now, I will forget as we start. Uh, thanks for joining us, Gareth. Good to see you. Uh, Cla Claudio, hi. Nice to see hi. you. How are you doing? Good, thanks. And you guys? Good, yeah, very well. Thank you. Yeah, very well. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, and Manjula's here as well. Hi, Manjula. Nice to see you again. Morning. How are you, Justin? Very well. Thanks, Manjula. Manjula, you, you've not come straight from your gym gear today. I have. I have showered and I'm going to turn my camera off so I can have my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind watching you eat. That's absolutely fine. Um, thanks for joining us, Manjula. And we've got Hazel here as well. Morning, Hazel. Okay, Hazel's perhaps not got sound at the moment, but uh, Hazel, thank you for joining us. Uh, okay, let's make a start because um, I'm conscious of time this morning. Uh, so we will be on for about 50 minutes or so. The aim is to finish at about 5 to 10 because most people have a 10 o'clock. So uh, my aim is to get you away so you've got a five-minute kind of comfort period between now and your 10 o'clock. Um, so let us uh, let's let me share my slides because uh, I can see some stuff that you... Can't. Uh, so let me just get that up and running. Hold on a sec. Uh, there we go. Right. Okay. So this morning we're going to talk about uh, emotional intelligence. And, you know, emotional, I, I remember when I first started to work on emotional intelligence, first learnt about emotional intelligence, it was quite, I, I found it quite simple and transformational in terms of how it helped me as a business leader. So I'm going to hopefully share some of those insights with you this morning. And I'll, cut, I'll hopefully come at it from a position that's, you know, not the usual stuff that we cover. So a, a couple of different angles on it. Um, the idea of these sessions, uh, I, I, I'm running these, I'll, I'll talk at the end about what the next steps are. I've got a couple of other workshops coming up that you, you, are, you or your teams are very welcome to join. Uh, but the idea of these workshops is to create some thinking space because everyone's so busy, there's so much going on all the time in our you know weekly working lives that this is really about giving you some clear thinking space where you haven't got all the noise of everything else that's going on uh, in in the business. So uh, I, I would say you know this morning, if you can, just give yourself the the uh, opportunity just to focus today on, on this topic because that that will give you that window uh, in your in your mind really and that, that's the important bit in your mind to be able to focus on what's most important and start to think about what you might need to change and I, those of you who have been on these sessions before will know some of the insights that we share but one of the things that i find absolutely fascinating is that for most people our we we generate this the recurring the same recurring thoughts around 90 percent of the time so to break that pattern of thinking to stop you from just going on to default is really important. You need other people's ideas. You need mentoring discussions. You need coaching conversations to start to break the pattern of thinking. And, and as I, you know, I think about my own life and my own work and the things that I do, and it, it's so true. You end up going back to the same thoughts. So the idea of these uh, sessions is to kind of stimulate your thinking, give you a few new ideas today. And, and I'd I'd love for you to think about. Um, what you were looking to get from today's session. You, if you want to share it in the chat, do feel free to do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I prompt on this, not every time, but I prompt on it every now and then because the evidence is really interesting that when you go into a session like this and you say, actually, there's one thing I'm really looking to get from it, that can be really useful because it starts your cognitive processing and, and triggers your uh, reticular activating system, which is, you know, the goal setting system in the mind. So if there's one thing you want to get from today's uh, session, maybe write it down for yourself. If you want to put it in the chat, feel free. Um, if there is something specific and you want to put it in the chat, please do, because I'll make sure that we cover that as part of today's session. So if there is something specific that you're looking to get from today, just drop it in the chat. Uh, I'll just put the chat live, actually. Uh, the chat is here so that you can see where it is it should be on your on your toolbar you'll see there's just a, a, a button for the chat so if there is if there's like one thing you were as you came into today you were thinking i'd really like to understand a bit more about that or how that plays uh, a role in your leadership then feel free to drop it into the chat and I'll, I'll just make sure that i aim to cover that as part of the content today even if it's not part of the slides that we'll talk to it as part of the the conversation session Okay, uh, while while you're doing that, let me um, let me make a start. So we, we'll talk about emotional intelligence, uh, and as I said before, you know, it really is in my experience. Good morning. Hugely. Hi. 
Joe's met somebody on a walk. Um, it's hugely, I've just muted you, Joe, by the way. Um, it's hugely beneficial to leadership and, and it can be transformational if you if you understand the model and start to work on it uh, specifically. And we'll, we'll talk this morning about what emotional intelligence is and why it's important. We'll talk about the impact of emotional intelligence and then some, some techniques and ideas on how to develop it. And and hopefully, you know, share, share some things that are perhaps, as I said before, not in the normal content that you get if you would uh, start to talk about emotional intelligence. Um, okay, oh, oh, Chris, thanks for your uh, note in the chat. So Chris says, uh, keeping personal emotions in check when dealing with a less emotionally aware individual, someone else that's perhaps less emotionally aware. Yeah, I, I, and I'm sure you've got plenty of examples of that, Chris. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely talk to that as well. Thanks, Chris. Oh, Gareth. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, Gareth says, would also like to understand more about how to encourage and develop emotional intelligence for those who work with or for me. Yeah. So how do we start to help other people to develop their own emotional intelligence? There are, there are a few things that we'll, we'll talk about today that I will definitely help you with, with both of those uh, requests. So thank you. That's great. Um, I often share this coach leadership model. It's a, it's a system that I pulled together as uh, when I was actually in a business leadership role, it's kind of, you know, you get asked to do like, well, what's your plan if you're coming into this role? How are you going to how are you going to develop the team? And this is something that I pulled together in combination with a coach I was working with and a coaching program I was on and the business leader that I was working with uh, when I was in, in 3M in, a, in a, running a very large business. And what we what we developed was this playbook and the playbook really talks about, first of all, having a plan, a business plan. Uh, and that sounds obvious, but it's amazing how many clients I work with who just are, are, haven't quite got round to the planning stage. They're, they're brilliant leaders, but they haven't quite got a clear plan that they can articulate. So actually going back a couple of steps can be useful. Um, then, then we think about the center of this model is about making sure there's high trust and, and a positive relationship with your teams, because without trust and the, the relationship in place, actually coaching isn't effective because people won't really engage with coaching if they don't trust the person coaching them. Uh, and then we think about how, how do we coach as leaders so that we're not constantly having to make, you know, make all the decisions, uh, drive all the activity, you know, really be the only person that's really focusing on what's most important. How do we foster that within our teams? We do it through a coaching approach. And I'll just quickly walk through this model because it links to leadership to, to emotional intelligent leadership. So the C is contracting, so have a strategic conversation with people about what, what you are agreeing around setting the standard. Um, being able to clearly articulate objectives and goals and having your teams be able to clearly art articulate their objectives and goals. Uh, and lots of businesses will have job descriptions, but they don't necessarily monitor and track objectives, which is really, really useful and important. And then the A is action. So having your team, you're watching your team in action. It's action and observation. So creating some space to observe your team doing what they do, because that gives you a window. You know, everyone's heard of the Jahari window, right? The window where people can't see what they can't see. They're just, it's, they're oblivious to it. We all have it, right? Um, and so action and observation gives you that gives you that visibility. And from that point of visibility, you're able to coach people to improve, develop and change. And that, that's the effective way to coach. So we hear a lot about coaching, but we don't hear a lot about how do you set up, you know, the right environment for high performance and coaching. We do it through these four stages. And then the final piece, the H is heroes in the making. This is about development planning, helping people to think bigger, see the, see where they fit in the future of the organization. And that, and that could be really powerful as well because it engages and motivates and inspires people. So, so I share that because as a system, it's really good. It's all in the book, Coaching Leaders. Uh, re really deep dives into any of that. If you'd uh, like a copy, you feel free to grab one. You can get it on Amazon. And I'm happy to send anyone a digital copy if you'd like one as well. So um, becoming an emotionally intelligent leader, let's talk about uh, emotional intelligence as a model. So the first time I read about emotional intelligence was probably about 2006 when I was first in a leadership role. It was recommended to me. And it was a, a model that was developed by a, a, a guy called Daniel Goleman and his research team in the US. And what, what they did was just start to map out 
what exactly is emotional intelligence and how can we develop it? And there, there are there were originally four stages to the model. There's now they've added a fifth in recent years. So let me just walk you through it because it will start to give you an idea of what what it is and how we develop it. So the first stage of emotional intelligence is what they call self awareness. So it's starting to become more aware of how you react and respond in different situations. And, and in leadership situations, obviously, we, we encounter much more challenge than most positions in a business. So actually starting to become aware of how different situations impact us and what happens to our emotions and how we respond is really important because that awareness is the first step in creating an opportunity for us to be able to change and adapt. So self-awareness is the first step. And sometimes that can be as simple as, you know, a, a reflection after certain meetings. It might be priming yourself before going into a meeting to be more present, to be more aware of what happens as you as you meet difficult characters or you meet difficult situations. So self-awareness is the first step. And, and interestingly, you know, self-awareness by its, by, on its own is, is not enough because, I, I mean, I, I have countless examples but i have one particular example where you know i work for a business director in one of my final roles uh, in, a, in a large corporation and he was people called him the hammer and the reason they called him the hammer was because he just used to hammer people he was really aggressive he, he used to ask really pointed aggressive questions uh, and he was it, it was on it was verging on bullying it was just it was just on the right side of you know being able to get away with it but it, but it was everyone everyone that met him was always a little bit apprehensive and i gave him some feedback because i was reporting to him and his feedback to me was yeah i know i know but it's effective right so so self awareness on its own is not good enough right <laughs> but the second step and this is where emotional intelligence really starts to to build self awareness on its own is not enough the second step is being able to manage ourselves so once I become aware that maybe certain situations trigger, you know, an emotion in me, it might be, might be anxiety, it might be apprehension, it might be anger, it might be frustration, whatever it is. Once I learn that th this situation or this type of person or this type of conversation triggers this in me, I I've got to learn to create some distance between what's happening and start to manage my emotional response to it. And, and so self-management is the second step. And I think, you know, when I first learned about emotional intelligence, that was the bit that really started to resonate with me was being able to practice and be better at managing myself in more difficult situations. So, so we got these first two building blocks, becoming aware, and from that point of awareness, starting to improve the way we manage ourselves. And then the third element of emotional intelligence is what, what is called in the model social awareness or, or relationship awareness. So starting to not only manage ourselves and, and recognise what happens to us, but to, to um, actually Gareth's point, right? Starting to <clears throat> recognise, in fact, Gareth and Chris's point, starting to recognise what happens with other people. What do we notice about other people in our interactions and how different situations make them feel and respond and react? And, and through those cues, through that noticing and being aware of what's happened to other people, we can do one of, you know, a number of things. One is, you know, be a, be a bit more empathetic. Uh, two is to help them to start to see for themselves what happens uh, in certain situations and then start to help them to self-manage. So, so the model really does start to join up the dots between how we manage ourselves how we become aware of what's happening with other people, and that which of course brings us naturally to the fourth component, which is managing those relationships. So starting to understand and, and notice what's happening with other people, being more aware, tuning in, and then starting to have strategies, develop strategies for managing those situations with, with different people. And you know, sometimes that's about very often that's about being able to kind of move into a coaching conversation, be able to start to coach people to help them manage themselves. And when you get this, you know, that, that was the light bulb for me when I first started to work on emotional intelligence was, first of all, awareness of myself, certain situations, certain people m could trigger me. How do I start to manage myself in those situations so I don't react? Uh, I'm choosing the response instead. 
and then starting to, to notice what the way that other people behave and the impact that has on them and other people in the business and start to have much better coaching conversations to help those people to become more aware and start to manage themselves more effectively in a way that was positive for them and not wasn't seen as criticism. And that, that was the big thing. How do we help people stay motivated through that conversation? So, that, so they're the four steps. And then that, that was the original model. And more recently, you know, probably about three or four years ago, uh, Daniel Goldman and the team updated the model to add a fifth component. And the fifth component they call motivation. And the reason motivation's in there is because it, it, as well as the four cornerstones of emotional intelligence, what they found in businesses, especially if you get long tenure, if you've been working in a business for a while, you've been leading a team for a while, it can be really easy for things to go off the boil. And managing intrinsic self-motivation as leaders and then being able to really use that intrinsic personal motivation to inspire and motivate our teams is really important, especially over long-term relationships, because otherwise we can find it's really easy to just be almost feel like we're on the treadmill and, you know, one day goes into a week, goes into a month, goes into a quarter, a year, and all of a sudden we can start to just feel a little bit numb to, to what it is we're doing. So actually that ability to reignite passion, reignite motivation as a leader is really important because the leader is the person that does that, right? The, the leader is the person that is able to, to create that uh, motivation for themselves and other people. Nobody will do it. No one else does it or has the same impact in doing it as the leader does. So, so, that, so that's the emotional intelligence model. They're the five key components. Um, I also want to talk about uh, a couple of other elements and then, then we'll open it up to um, some conversations. Uh, I don't know if anybody's read the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I've mentioned this before on previous uh, workshops. But there's a, if you haven't, it's, it's um, very often, if you, if you research you know, top 10 books to read in your life, Man's Search for Meaning is, will be in the top 10. And the book is written by uh, Joe's Joe's thumbs up. Joe's Joe's read it. Um, the 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 book talks about. So Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist, and he was a Jewish psychiatrist who was captured by the Nazis and taken to Auschwitz. And the the book is in two parts. The first part is his experiences of living through Auschwitz, which is pretty harrowing. Uh, but he was one of the few survivors. And after Auschwitz, he then developed a like a psychiatric model, a thinking model called logotherapy. And what that logotherapy um, practice teaches people is th this quote here: that between something happening, stimulus, and response, you know, our response to it, someone else's response to it, there is a space. And in that space is anybody's power to choose how we respond and that that response is where you know growth freedom better decision making um and, and all sorts of you know value lies for us as individuals so uh, you don't have to read the book it's a great read it's not an expensive book and it's quite short i think when i first read it i read it in a weekend because it's quite a compelling read um and and it's and it's just it's just useful it's one of those books that also puts a bit of perspective on life makes you kind of perhaps a little more grateful for for um you know where we are and the age we live in um but i want to i want to talk about a couple of other things and then we'll then we'll uh, talk about uh, we'll, we'll get some feedback so state contagion I, I don't know if anybody's heard of this term state contagion if you haven't heard the term you probably will understand almost immediately what it means but the the, the way that our minds uh, work is that we have this we, we they call it the open loop system and the open loop system is there for a reason. It's there for us to be able to connect and build relationships. So it's really positive. Um, and what it means is we're wired to pick up very subtle cues from people about how they might be feeling, what they might be thinking. Uh, and, and that's why sometimes you'll say, you know, you, you'll notice someone say, are you, are you OK? Or you might, you know, just you just get a sense whether someone's, you know, perhaps a little feeling a little bit off. And it's because of this mm -hmm. state contagion uh, phenomenon. But. It's a, it's a really good thing, but it can also be a, a, a challenge for us because resonance, you know, positive mindset is contagious, but so is dissonance. So if you have too many people in the business that are feeling, you know, a little bit, you know, disgruntled, have issues 
or whatever, that, that state contagion can start to you know, proliferate across the organization. And for leaders in particular, you know, our, our, our ability to influence people is greater than anyone else in the organization. So we, we should start to think about the emotional state that we take into different situations and think, I like the question, a sense check question, is the state I'm in, the emotional state I'm in, worth catching? Would I want someone to catch how I'm feeling today? And, it, and it's a really good leveler for each of us to say, do you know what, actually, perhaps sometimes I need to work on priming myself first ahead of some of those conversations I might have uh, with other people in the business and certainly with, with our teams. Um, and then I, I like to think about communication mix. And if we think about you know how we're communicating and what happens when we're communicating, you might have seen this um, example, this, this statistic before, but it was done by uh, this research team by a guy called Dr. Albert Morabian. And they've got this 7%, 38%, 55% rule. And what it shows is that 7% of what we communicate uh, this, I, this, is the spoken word. So when people are listening to us and receiving us, seven, the 7% 7 of that mix, the whole communication mix, is just what we're saying. 38% uh, is the way we say it. So the voice, the tone, the pace, the pitch, all, all of that stuff. That 38% of the way we deliver the word is what's received in communication. And then, of course, the remaining 55% is body language. So it's what we, it's how we show up and, and how congruent it looks as we're, as we're talking to people and communicating. And, and as leaders, this is particularly important. If we think about emotional intelligence, we think about those situations that might cause us to, to, to react in whatever way, you know, frustration, anger, anxiety, apprehension, whatever it is, we recognise that even if we're trying to mask that, as we're communicating, you know, 55% being body language, it, it kind of spills out of us. And the interesting thing that, that I find from, from that communication mix is that 7%, the spoken word is conscious. It's what we think about. The remaining voice, tone, body language, the remaining 93% is unconscious. So that means it happens on autopilot. We don't always consider how we deliver unless we start to practice these things and develop it much more intentionally that's why emotional intelligence is so important to develop um and then and then final thing i want to share with you because uh, hopefully uh, it will be useful uh, and then then i'll come back to some of your comments as well so so thank you um so consider these two sequences i, I like to think about emotional self control so most most life situations or work situations that happen something happens an event happens you know, we, we go into a meeting, we have a, a conversation, uh, we're challenged by somebody. Um, <clears throat> just, a, an event happens. Uh, normally what happens is people react to the event. And once they've reacted to the event, then there's an outcome. So something happens, people react, there's a consequence or an outcome of, of, of that reaction. Um, and what, em what emotional intelligence teaches us is that actually we should, we should try and switch the second and third step. And what, what does that mean? What it means is that an event happens, something happens, we, you know, we get a difficult conversation with a customer or a team member, or, or, you know, you're in a meeting where someone's highly challenging. And rather than just reacting, what we should do is pause for a second. That's what emotional intelligence teaches us to pause. Don't react. We pause. We think, okay, what outcome do I want here? And from that position, what, and, and I've tried this and, and it can be really effective if you can, you can create that mental space for yourself. What outcome do I want here? And then how do I respond to meet that outcome? It sounds simple when I say it, doesn't it? <laughs> when you end up in some of those really difficult conversations, it's not quite so easy. But if you can remind yourself in those situations to pause ask the, the question I ask is okay what's what's the outcome I want it makes me stop and think it's it's and then usually my response is completely different from the reaction I would have had if I just reacted to the event and it, it, it can be really useful to start to we, we pull all these things together as part of our emotion intelligence models you think about you know self-awareness self-management becoming more aware of what's happening with other people managing those conversations coaching maintaining motivation then we start to think about self-control creating space and all of these things join up to help us really become much more effective 
at managing those conversations, managing ourselves and becoming more emotionally intelligent. Okay. Um, I, I thought I'd share this quote. I love this quote. Empathy depends not only on, on one's ability to identify someone else's emotions, that's the, the social awareness part of emotional intelligence, but also on one's capacity to put oneself in the other person's place and to experience an appropriate emotional response. Useful that, isn't it? Useful. It's a useful way to think about how we how we develop emotional intelligence. Okay, we covered uh, quite a bit of stuff here. I've been talking for about 25 minutes, I think. Um, I, I'm going to pause the thinking now. So there's a couple of things here. We've got the emotional intelligence model, becoming an emotionally intelligent leader. And we've got developing emotional self-control. And we've got this stimulus and response. So we've got quite a few people on the call this morning. What um, I propose, if you're all up for it, is that I'll create maybe uh, three breakout rooms and we'll give you a chance to meet and greet this morning, say hi to each other, do a quick round of introductions, and then we'll give you a chance to talk about what we've covered this morning and perhaps what it might be what it might mean for you and how it could be useful for you as you start to, to develop this area of emotional intelligence. Before we do that, just let me go back through the um, comments in the chat just to make sure I've not missed anything. W welcome to those of you who have joined us uh, after we got started. Thank you for joining this morning. Um, Claudio, the one thing I've had to adapt was with being more aware of how people react or respond and identify themselves yeah that that's something we, when you're in leadership it it's quite a transition to make when you have to be adapting continually to different responses because sometimes people respond in ways that you don't uh, anticipate yeah thanks thanks claudia um thanks sarah good recommendation nice to see you. thanks for joining us sarah um yeah Man manjula re re referenced the 55 percent body language so much is lost online absolutely and, and that's i think that's why <clears throat> being uh being able to be on video be on, you know having a camera on is really useful for you if you're a leader uh, even if people don't have their cameras on to have your camera on is really is really useful for you um fiona says i have a lot of conversations in the car interesting as i'm not seeing the response uh, or my colleague isn't seeing there's so yes yeah, so, so in in the car on the phone so you're missing out on that 55 percent uh body language uh gareth says have the same have the same thoughts although i believe it is still better to speak and have dialogue rather than just communicate through email absolutely which is basically a series of monologues which i've definitely experienced yeah and the, and can be open to misinterpretation as well um very uh very easily um fiona oh so fiona said um she's struggling with kind of uh the cafe and getting busy in the earphones so so she won't uh, she won't join the breakouts but that's okay thanks thanks Fiona for letting me know okay let me um everyone okay is everyone okay to do a breakout session this morning to yeah yeah great introduce yourselves to each other have some conversations let me create I'll create three rooms I'll let it assign automatically uh let me just check yeah looks looks good um so hopefully an opportunity to to meet uh somebody new this morning and uh an opportunity to uh give yourselves you know uh, some thinking space around what we've covered and what it means for you so i'll open some rooms i'll give you um we'll go until quarter two so about 12 minutes because then i'd love to come back and just get take some feedback from each of the rooms so just over 10 minutes in the room quick introductions open up the topic uh, and, and over to you to, to have a conversation. I hope you enjoy meeting somebody new this morning. I'm going to, uh, I hope you, I hope you enjoyed your conversations this morning. Did everyone get to meet somebody new this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Everyone had a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good. E excellent. Well, th thanks for, thanks for taking part in that. It's, it, I think it's a big part of the value of these workshops is the opportunity to meet other business leaders and share some of your experiences. Cause there's some, interesting commonality i'm sure you found as well um so let's uh let's just take a bit of feedback from each of the groups um we had three groups who, who would like to share something from your group perhaps an insight or something that you uh you thought was was useful yeah i'll, I'll, I'll talk um from yeah thanks guys from group from group one um it was interesting one of the things that we were actually talking about a little bit at the end is the amount of distractions that there are 
now for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, and what was kind of amusing is right at the start of the breakout, I got distracted because my brother had been pestering me um, to respond to something. And normally he doesn't pester me. So I was like, maybe there's something going on. So, yeah. But the the point of the, the I suppose, the discussion is, is how do you manage that level of distraction that can exist? And it's m- much easier to be distracted, I suppose, when you're not face to face. And also we touched on um, a, a sort of a generational issue, i.e., um, that I I found, and I think it resonated with other the, the other others on the on the um, breakout that um, if you like younger members of the team quite often respond quite quickly because they're used to this kind of cadence of short messages yeah that they send between each other and of course if you've got young kids or even you know teenagers or whatever then you get the same treatment as a parent as well mm-hmm. and it's how do you manage that when it goes into the workplace so that was that was one of the things that we talked about yeah, yeah that's it. especially if you've got people that are dealing with customers or clients and you mm-hmm. actually need that level of professionalism it's how you how you create that uh, difference in approach yeah very good yeah i like that it, thanks, interesting. Thanks, Interesting, we went the other way. So on the generational thing, we actually said a lot stems back to an, an old heritage style. So, you know, 15, 20 years ago, pre-COVID, even years before that, mm. we were we were all, you know, as managers, trapped and chased at, for numbers, Excel spreadsheets, forecasting. So as you went up from management to country manager and up, you lost the sense of value of a person and you were more focused on an Excel spreadsheet and a number. Yeah. And uh, then it depends on the style of that person, you know, and perhaps their background. We discussed, I'm Italian, you know, we perhaps uh, back then, our managers were a lot more heavy handed on us. Yeah. Uh, and do we filter that down? So, you know, the barrier is broken and understanding and becoming more aware of mm. how people and perhaps as uh, Gareth was saying, you know, you get somebody of my age at 50 trying to manage somebody who's 22 and we have very different structures and very different backgrounds. Mm. Yeah, and you're right. And that generational difference is significant. It's probably more significant now than I think it's been in the past. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Because technology is accelerating so quickly. Yeah. And and I don't think there's any, you know, there's no silver bullets in this. It, It is about, if you look at emotional intelligence, actually, and the components of it and coaching as it aligns with it, it does help you to build empathy for other people and start to think you know, through the eyes of your teams who have a different experience, want different things from the business, want different things from the role. And whilst you can't always meet all of their you know, um, requirements, actually right. what you can do is start to empathize and have conversations where you kind of find some common ground. And I think that's really useful. But it, but as you, to your point, Claudio, it's it's completely opposite from just, you know, can you give me this data, this information? I need, you know, we, we need to just functionally do what we need to do to run the business. It, yeah. There's a nuance to it that uh, that I think needs, probably needs uh, revisiting. Yeah, it's good. That's we, good. Uh, Thank you. We, did, we didn't pull out the theme of the, the generational difference, but we did um, we did touch on the the objective nature of it or the, the lack of objective nature of it, more, more it's, it's subjective. So one person's view of their emotional intelligence versus another can be can be widely widely different than how you have that coaching conversation, how you can be aligned on something where you've just got these two polar views. And so do had some good ideas around how you break it down a little bit, bit at a time, work on behave, uh, observed behaviours, et cetera, mm-hmm. as, as you go through. But there's, there's certainly a, a difficulty there because it's not a black and white situation. It's not a yes or a no or on an objective or a plan that was or wasn't met it's a it's a very personal linked mm. feeling and emotion yeah it is yeah it is and and that's it's a good it's a really good point because we often think of work environments and you know teams we manage as you know almost functional and, and work but recognizing that works like a third of your life isn't it you know you've got a third sleeping a third at work and then a third is is personal and actually, we take ourselves with us wherever we go. So, so all of us are emotional beings, right? Having a human experience, not the other way around. So we have to recognise that people are emotion, emotional. They will be emotional. And actually, that regulation and development of emotional intelligence takes time for people. 
you know, we, we see it very often in the, in the teams that we lead, don't we? And their, their natural responses to things. We also picked up on um, baggage, for example, mm -hmm. as, a, as a new person coming in into a senior role. Um, you don't know the story behind all the previous managers before you. Yeah. So the staff also have been handled or trained or character, built a character. So that's also, you know, and mm -hmm. being more self-aware. I, I use that as an example when I moved into the senior role for Kurt that they had six directors before me in four years. And, wow. you know, it was really, I stopped and, and spent more time with them, understanding their worries, their concerns, and their frustrations before I could implement the company's uh, motto and goals. Yeah, It was, for me, you know, I was a little older than them and I had a different nature of doing things and I, I adapted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's another really good point. That when, especially if you're a new leader coming into a new team, a new business, the, their experience of the former leaders, previous leaders, is going to taint their initial perspective of what they what they think you're going to do and how you're going to behave. And actually, sometimes that can be something that needs to be overcome yeah. before you can actually start to foster those relationships and, and build a coaching culture. Yeah, yeah, really good, really great insights this morning, everybody. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, so let's just wrap up uh, today's call. Thanks everyone for joining us. There's a couple of things I will just share with you uh, while I've got you still here. Hold on a sec. Let me, um, oh yeah, in fact, I won't go full PowerPoint mode. I'm just gonna share a couple of things. <laughs> if anybody's interested in uh, learning a bit more about developing coaching as a style, um, I have this tool that I, that I use. It's really useful. We use it on our programs. It's called the Coaching Leaders Scorecard. I'll just share the link with you in the chat it's a really nice diagnostic tool it asks you about uh, it asks you 48 questions not about 40 it asks you exactly 48 questions that just start to get prompt your thinking around how you're leading your teams how you could start to become more of a coach and what are some of the techniques and tactics that you could use to do that it's, it's, a, it's been a really we get really good feedback on on the on the scorecard it'll give you some scores and suggest some suggestions afterwards as well uh, we have this toolkit that we use in the programs that helps you to start to document and build a plan around how you how you develop this. If anybody is interested in that, I'm happy to, to share that with you. Uh, I wanted to share, I'm doing a few different events coming up over the next uh, month. So there's discovering what your clients really need, which is a sales clinic for sales teams. If any of you are leading sales teams and think that might be useful, it's on 16th of October, which is next uh, Wednesday morning, 9 till 9.45. So it's really helping sales teams to understand the critical role that questioning and listening plays in the sales process. Um, on the Friday, the 25th of October at 9 a.m., I'm running a, a one-hour workshop on successful virtual and remote selling for sales teams. If anybody's uh, interested or if you've got any business development teams that you think might be useful or might find that useful. And then the next leadership workshop will be Friday, the 8th of November. So in a month, uh, pretty much four weeks today, building resilient and effective teams. How do we help teams build resilience and become more effective and productive. So that, that's the next uh, upcoming events. And then if anybody is interested in one of our programs, I run basically do two things, uh, sales training programs and leadership development programs, specifically with this view on coaching. If you're interested in one of the programs, feel free to just message me and, le and let me know. I'll, I'll happily send you details. We're building our cohorts for 2025 at the moment. Uh, and if anybody would like to, a discovery call, like a quick, uh, like a forty-five minute conversation, to talk about you know your business, what your plans are, uh, and perhaps get either a bit of coaching direction or see if there's a fit with some of the work we do, uh, my calendar link is in the diary there. That will take you straight through to my calendar. You'll be able to book a forty-five minute slot uh, at your at your convenience. So. Uh, that is everything. I I, we, I will let you go because it's five to ten. I'm sure you've all got ten o'clock appointments. So feel free to drop off. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm happy to stay on if anybody has got any other questions or anything outstanding that you just want to check in with me. I'll stay on. But otherwise, have a wonderful Friday, everybody. It's nearly the weekend. Nearly the weekend. Just get out of the way and then it's Saturday. And <laughs> I look forward to seeing you all at a future session. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Justin. Thank I'm just you. checking. Are you going to email out the links to all those um, yeah. next sessions you've just mentioned? Yes, I'll put that in the email, Joe, so that you can register for them uh, and join. Lovely. Yeah. Wonderful. And I've already booked my Calendly appointment with you later, so I'll, I'll see you, I'll see see you, you, uh, see you for the chat.
Amazing. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Have a lovely weekend. Bye -bye. Bye. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Thanks, everyone. See you bye. soon. Thanks. Bye.